All right, so it's noon, so we'll get started here. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily Vanforth. I am the new curator here at the Philip J. Curry Museum. Um, and I'm very welcome, very happy to welcome you to our virtual speaker series for February 2020. Um, I'm very happy to introduce um, actually one of my former lab mates uh, who is going to talk to us about fish evolution. Uh, so Dr. Emily Stanton has always been fascinated by fish. She did a degree in marine biology and oceanography at the University of King's College Dalhousie a master's studying salmon migration at the University of British Columbia, and a PhD looking at fish fin hydrodynamics at Harvard University. Happy to return to Canada, she completed a postdoctoral degree at McGill University with a mission of understanding how fish use fins to move on land. Currently, she's an associate professor at the University of Ottawa, where she runs the Comparative and Evolutionary Biomechanics Lab. So I will... Uh, just uh, turn off my video here and I'll turn it over to you, Em. Great, thanks a lot. All right, this is quite exciting. I, I really like talking about fish, so it's fun to be here and, uh, and reach out to you guys. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the diversity in the Devonian and then how fishes became tetrapods. So the image that you see here is an art artistic rendition of what it might've been like in the Devonian under the water. Oh. There we go. So always I start by sort of going over why fish are interesting. And I do this because I love fish. So I think they're really interesting, but I always have to remind myself that maybe that's not the case for everyone. <laughs> so fish are interesting because they're very diverse. We see here, this is a, a, a sort of portrayal of the diversity of fish. And it shows you when they first arrived. So you can see along this line here on the Y. Oh, can you see my pointer? No, let me make this better for you. So along here, what we've got is uh, a time period when fish first arrived on the scene down here in the Ordovician. And then the size of the blob that you see there is the number of species that are represented. So you can see there's a big bunch of jawless fishes and then there are fewer that come to the modern world. And then for each group, you can see this happening. And what I like and what you know drove me to loving fish as a little kid is the diversity of fish that we have in present day. So we have quite a few cartilaginous fishes, a huge number of ray fin fishes. And then over here is what we're gonna be talking about today the rise of tetrapods out of the fishes. So this is why fishes are interesting. They have an incredible diversity. As you can see here, this is a, a lovely, fantastical image by Ray Troll, but this is the Amazonian fishes. But I want you to think just, a, I mean, we, we live in a time that's so privileged because we have amazing things like BBC who take images of animals under the water for us so that we can watch them in the comfort of our living rooms. And the diversity that we see is in incredible. So any shape, size, color exists in the fish world. And what I wanna start with today is not so much the transition from fishes to tetrapods, which are the animals that walked on land, but more so what is it to be successful in evolution? So what made the fishes successful? And we'll start by thinking about three different things. The first being respiration. So in order to be a living thing, an animal, we need to respire, we need to feed our cells. Cells need oxygen. If you are one cell, it's quite easy to get oxygen. It just diffuses across your membrane, everything works out fine. As you grow and you get larger and larger, you have to make your surface area bigger and bigger so that you can get that oxygen you need to feed all of those cells. And then at some point you become quite complex as an organism and your tissues are diverse and they're deep within you. So you need to have a circulatory system and a way to get that oxygen from the environment into your system to be able to control it or be able to use that oxygen. And fish have done this beautifully using gills. So you can see here, gills are just a really fancy way to increase your surface area so that oxygen-rich water coming through 
provides the oxygen to the body. So this is great. Fish did this very early on. So if we look at our tree again, way down here, we see the start of these sorts of gills, this sorts of ways to get the nutrients and, and chemicals you need out of your environment into your system. <laughs> Pardon me. The next thing we're gonna think about is feeding. So this is sort of like first aid, right? If anyone's done first aid, airway, breathing, circulation. The first thing that's important is respiration. We gotta get oxygen to those tissues. Second is providing nutrients for those tissues so that they can grow. Feeding is an excellent way to get nutrients into the system. So development of jaws, of teeth, and of suction to pull things in. And I've got two pictures down here of two very interesting animals that still exist on our planet. These are the last two surviving agnathans. When I say agnathan, that just means without a jaw. So you can see this is a lamprey on the right and a hagfish on the left. And neither of them have a lower jaw. They just have this circle that is a mouth that, with rasping teeth that they burrow into the side of fish and, and suck blood. That's what the lamprey does. The hagfish is more of a scavenger on the bottom of the ocean. So these guys is, were where we started and the advent of things like jaws and teeth and then suction feeding made feeding far more uh, successful. I'm gonna show you this video. Hopefully YouTube will work for me. This is an example of where one line of evolution in terms of the, the advent of incredible jaws and suction feeding. So this is a modern teleos feeding on a, uh, another modern teleos, a guppy. So if we watch this, is it gonna go? Interesting. Sorry guys, let me just see. I wonder if it's because I'm on pointer. I don't think so. I'm gonna break out and show you this way. So as you see the fish approach, it has an incredible capacity to open its full jaws. That creates a huge volume inside its mouth and it sucks the water and the prey in. So very effective way of feeding. There we go. Sorry about that technical glitch. So, <coughs> oh, my star disappeared. So right here, just before the placoderms is where the jaws arrived. And you see what's interesting is with the advent of jaws comes this ability to diversify. So you can see Jaws appear here, and all of this diversification stems from there. So what I wanna, the point I wanna get across is that it's super interesting to think about what are the evolutionary steps, the characters that arrive that allow a group of animals to speciate and diversify. And Jaws here, just before the placoderms, is one of them. Another one brings us to locomotion. And here, also just before the placoderms, we have the advent of very interesting body forms. We've got skeleton happening. Here's an astracoderm. These guys have real bone all of a sudden. <laughs> Ferris Jenkins, who was one of my supervisors doing my PhD, used to say, these guys just have garbing, garbage cans for heads because <laughs> they're heavily, heavily armored. Also groups of these fish developed fins. So you can see here the paired fins on these animals. Once you start developing um, skeletons, muscles that can act on those skeletons and fins, you start to be able to locomote, to move around and control your body position. That control is very important for getting away from predators, but also attacking prey. Then of course we have the placoderms and you can see these guys fully jawed. They've got that bottom mandible that's very effective at slicing. These guys have incredible bony teeth that these aren't real teeth, not teeth like later on in evolution, but they're the extension of bony plates that come out of the skull to, uh, to act as teeth very effectively. So we see these evolutionary changes that give um, 
advantageous uh, benefits for moving around. The other thing we see, and this is an example of modern fishes, are other adaptations. So here are tails. And if you imagine all the fish that you've seen in your, in your lifetime, there's a variety of different forms for tails and fins and body shapes in fishes. And this is because evolution has selected for all sorts of different shapes and sizes for different functions. In this case, the, the, the story of the tail, what we see here is a um, rounded tails, very good for maneuvering, turning quickly. And then you come over here to really high velocity tails where animals have semi-lunate tails that, um, that provide really fast ability to swim. Not great for maneuvering, but the selection is for the open ocean and fast swimming. So what we see in the fishes of modern day today is this diversification of form and subsequent function. So here we are, back in the Devonian, we can imagine this diversity existing within these, this assemblage, assemblage of fishes. <coughs> Pardon me. So the question is, you're a fish in the Devonian, there's this great amount of diversity we see there. How do they leave the water? And we know there's those three very important things, respiration, feeding, and locomotion. But once you leave water and go to land, there's some serious problems. The first one is that gas exchange needs to happen still, but without desiccation. When you get on land, what happens is you dry out. And so gills, which are highly effective underwater because they're kept in a moist environment, become very dangerous and deleterious on land because they can dry out and that will kill the fish. Not only does it stop gas exchange, but the animal actually loses valuable fluids. So we have to get over that hurdle. The feeding hurdle is a big one too, because underwater, as we saw from that crazy fish, they use suction feeding. They change the volume of their mouth really quick and that sucks in the water and the prey that's in the water. Highly effective underwater, completely ineffective on land because air is so much less dense, nothing gets sucked in. So how do we get around that? The other thing to think about is fish don't have necks. So if you think of all the fish you know again, none of them have necks. It's because fish actually don't have cervical vertebrae. They just have thoracic and caudal vertebrae. And so if you don't have a neck in water, it's not so bad. You can move your whole body in the water column to approach your prey. But on land, when you're stuck on a platform that gravity is holding you down to, it's very useful to have a neck to be able to move your head around to capture your prey, to use those fancy jaws you've got to grab things to eat. And then finally in locomotion, gravity and friction change immensely when you're on land. So in water, it's a buoyant system, all is well. On land, you're held down by gravity and you have this added friction that your body against the, the soil is, you need energy to, to move it. And so without strong limbs or some sort of appendage to pick yourself up and move, it's very difficult to locomote. So with all of these hurdles, you'd wonder, why did fish leave water at all? Why did this happen? And the reason why it happened is because underwater wasn't the calmest of places to be. So we've had this huge diversification of fishes. There are predators like Dunkleosteus, this giant monster with bony ridge-like teeth uh, chasing you around, eating everything in sight. Everywhere you look, there's another animal in a niche eating resources, you know, attacking your, your uh, offspring. Lots of competition. And so if you were an animal that could get out onto land, you were at an advantage. So if we think of the Devonian as this rich ecosystem filled with all sorts of animals, and we, we know that there's competition because when we look at the assembly of animals that are there at that time, we see all sorts of really interesting things like the armor of the astracoderms, those garbage can fishes that have the protective, um, shields over their heads. 
We see fishes that have in, intense spines, numbers of spines on them. So this is obviously a world of, of violence, right? It's a fish eat fish world. And all of the animals are trying to avoid predation and evolving methods of being really competent predators. So there's pressure to leave that environment. At the same time, and this is something really interesting to think about because uh, we as very terrestrial animals have trouble imagining a planet Earth that doesn't have anything in a terrestrial environment. But this was the case. In the Devonian, things started to move out onto land. But prior to that, there was nothing out there. There were no plants, there were no animals, it was just rocks. And then plant life started to, to um, invade. Algae came out onto land. Some uh, invertebrates came out onto land. And by the Devonian, we actually start to see an environment that's terrestrial that has the capacity to provide shelter and possibly something to eat for lunch. And so any fish that was able to get out into that environment had an advantage. There were these untapped resources, untapped places to be, and you could get away from Dunkelosteus, who was like chasing behind you. So this is why, why leaving was a good idea for those fishes. So if we go back to our original question and think about our our Devonian shopping list. If we're, if we're doing this recipe and we need to take fish and turn it into tetrapod, what do we need? For our three major evolutionary um, things we have to address, respiration, feeding, and locomotion, we need lungs, right? Lungs are the best way to increase your surface area inside where they're, they're kept moist and protected. We need jaws, teeth, and a neck to be able to actually move around effectively on land, move our heads and use our jaws and teeth. And then for locomotion, we need supportive appendages. So those are three solutions for the problems that we, we need to overcome if we're gonna take advantage of this new environment and get away from Dunkelosteus. So this is a question that people have thought about for a long, long, long time. It's intrigued folks for decades and decades. And I really love this picture because it's, it's an older picture, but it's sort of the imagined form of the ancestor, the fishy ancestor that crawled out onto land. And we see here, it's quite fish-like. It's got pretty robust fins, nice vertebral column. Um, but yeah, kind of has all the things it needs to walk around on land. What we don't have are a lot of examples of fossils across this transition. It's starting to fill in. And as Emily and I were talking about before this talk, uh, Tiktaalik is one of the, the nicest finds in recent history. Um, this is an animal that was found in the north of Canada. And uh, the man you see in that slide there is Ferris Jenkins, who was leading the trip that found this fossil. Um, and he, he was one of my supervisors during my PhD. And so we talked a lot about Tiktaalik. It had just been found and it was very exciting. And so I was a bit obsessed with Tiktaalik during my, uh, my formative years. Anyway, I have a soft spot for this fish. But there are others <laughs> that are equally important. So here's a very simple cladogram of various examples of fossil material that suggests the transition from paleoniscid fishes all the way up to full-on tetrapods. And you can see here, we start with Eustinopteron, which is a very common, also a Canadian fish, um, that is very fish-like. You could show that to a kindergarten child and they'd say, oh, that's a fish. Once we get up the tree a little farther, you start to see interesting traits happening. The lobes of the fins are getting a little bit bigger. So this is pandericthes. It's changing its shape a little bit. It's getting its head is dorsal ventrally flattened. You know, it's obviously spending a lot of time in shallow water. There's our lovely friend Tiktaalik, who has interesting uh, joints forming in its fin. So more functionality, more movement. Then we get up into the real tetrapods, the true tetrapods, ichthyostega and acanthostega. What's interesting about these two is they're still aquatic animals. 
So they're fundamentally aquatic and they know this because of the position of the limbs. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but they also have complete digits and several other traits that make them very much tetrapods. And then as we climb up the tree, we get into absolutely terrestrial tetrapods that are living and walking around on land. But you can see there's a slow transition, steady from fish-like up to tetrapod-like. What we're gonna focus on, of course, is this transition. How do you get from a fish to a tetrapod? <coughs> Pardon me. So we'll start with respiration. And so we need some way of gas, being able to do gas exchange without desiccation. And the thing that's really interesting is that when we look at the evolution of lungs, which are closely related to swim bladders, we see that lungs actually were around before things moved on to land. And so you see here, this is a, a tree of the fishes all the way up to tetrapods here, our sharks down here, the chondrichthians. And you can see very low down here, before the split of the ray fin and the lobe fin fishes, we have the advent of gill pouches for air breathing and then true ventral lungs. So this is exciting, right? Because this means that the fishes way back in the day, before they ever took a step on land, had lungs and had the capacity to breathe air. A little interesting aside that I'll just tell you because I think it's cool. Up here we have drawings of what the air bladder looked like or the, the swim bladder or lungs looked like. And you can see here, this is the esophagus drawn. And in the fishes on this side, we see that that organ that holds air is actually coming out of the top of the esophagus. So it's a, it's a dorsal opening. Whereas you see in the true lungs and also the most basal of the ray fin fishes, the polypterus here, we see that those lungs are coming out of the ventral part of that esophageal tract. So very interesting, a little bit of diversity there, but you can see absolutely hands down that advent of lungs is happening very early in evolution prior to coming out onto land. Another interesting thing that's happened is that there's a, a change in the position of the nostrils. So I don't know how many of you have thought about the nostrils of fishes before, <laughs> but most fish have nostrils just on their rostrum. At the front, there's an, a hole in and a hole out and the water flows through and inside that little tube are the sensory organs for smelling. So that's all good. As evolution happens, one of those holes migrates around into the mouth of the animal. So you can see here's a tetrapod. This is representing a frog, I guess. A represents the nostril on the outside of the animal and C represents the uh, hole into the mouth where the water passes. You may think, why does this matter? <laughs> but what's interesting about it is it allows the animal to then take that water that's going through to be it used for sensing smell and actually use that amount of water to push over the gills. So it helps with respiration. So you've got all of these little small changes that are uh, ameliorating or making better the situation for a terrestrial existence. Okay, so now we're gonna think about what's happened with locomotion. We need to overcome gravity and friction. What did the fish, what tools did the fish have that allowed them to do this? And first we need to get a little bit uh, used to the fish, the world of fishes. Here's another cladogram, which is just a method of organizing all the animals in a particular group. We see this is all of the, it's not all the vertebrates, but the high end of the vertebrate tree. Right here, you've got osteichthys, which is just a fancy word for bony fish. You've got actinopterygians in one group, sarcopterygians in the other group. It's a really nice divide. It's very clear who's an actinop and who's a sarcop. Those are very, 
large words for meaning ray fin fish. The actinopterygians are ray fin fish. The sarcopterygians are lobe fin fish. And the main thing that differs between these is the shape and how their fin is structured. So you can see here in the actinopterygii or the ray fin fishes, they've got a fin that's supported entirely by rays. And the muscles that drive this fin are all up close in the body. Whereas if you look at the sarcopterygian, you've got a lobe fin here where the, the bones have become more robust and the muscles are actually along that part of the fin and it creates this lobey part of the fin. So we see here that already there are different fishes that have started making their fins a little bit more robust. And this is interesting. If we look at the evolution of fins, so here we've got some drawings of different fins. There are two different types of fins. One are called the architidri. I'm sorry, actually, I'm just realizing that this slide is both in um, a, a mix up of French and English. So don't use this for a spelling test. <laughs> but here we've got the architidri fins, which have a single axis with radials that come out on either side. Whereas most of the fins you find in fishes, here we have examples of sharks and then other fishes, um, have this asymmetrical metatrigian axis to their fins, where you've got the axis going out one side of the fin with all the radials on the other side. And you can see this is found in all sorts of different fishes. The thing that's quite interesting is when we look at a developmental um, context in tetrapods, it's actually this metatrigial arrangement of fins that represents what we have in our own tetrapod uh, hands. And the way this works, just for those of you that are um, developmental uh, keeners, <laughs> Here's a, the example of the fish fin with a metatrigial axis where it's off-centered. Here's our, our main axis and then the radials at the side. This is represented in these cartoons. <laughs> Pardon me. And each one of these things represents a bone. As the embryo develops, you can see that that metatrigial axis is what all the other bones come out of. So you see them dividing and ossifying out. So that's how we know that the tetrapod limb, their tetrapod manus is uh, metatrigial in its axis, which is just kind of cool. So then the other thing that's happening here that's quite interesting is our friend Ichthyostega, I mentioned this earlier, an aquatic animal, but if you look at its skeleton, both on its hind limb and its forelimb, it has well-developed digits. So this is very interesting because if you look back here, particularly on the hind limb, the orientation of that limb to the pelvis, the way that femur goes into the pelvis, into the acetabulum, is very much in a position that would not work for walking, but works super well for swimming. So that's how the paleontologists understand that this thing most likely was an aquatic animal. The cool thing about all of this is that it's an aquatic animal with a complete set of digits. In fact, even more digits than you'd expect. <laughs> and so those digits tell us that digits actually evolved before movement of fishes up onto land. So once again, we've got this toolbox. In the Devonian Sea, we can shop for digits before we even have to go onto land. And then finally, this is just to put in your minds, the other thing that's very important once you get onto land is you have to support yourself um, from gravity, the force of gravity. And in order to get forces to pass from a limb up to support the body, it's very helpful to attach your pelvic girdle to your spine. So you can see here in this first image in A, this is a fish where the bones that support the fin are just sort of floating in the body. And that works in water because there's no gravitational loading there. As we get into the tetrapodomorphs, so moving up the tree, you can see that that 
that fin base is starting to get complex. It's breaking into three different bones and there's an actual acetabulum where the limb bone comes in. And then finally, when we're a true tetrapod, that top bone, which is the ilium, actually secures itself to this vertebral column. And that allows the force produced by the limb to actually get translated into the body of the animal and support the animal. So all sorts of really interesting changes that take place to ameliorate the capacity of the animal to move on land. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to feeding very briefly. How do we get a neck? So we're not gonna get suction back, that's for sure, because air is air. But if we can get a neck, we can use that fancy jaw to capture prey. And what we start to see, here's our Eustinopteron, and this is an early, <coughs> pardon me, tetrapod. What we start to see, here's our fin with our, our low robust support system. If you go up to the bones that support that fin, at the very top, these are the bones that secure themselves to the back of the skull. And one of the reasons why fish have no necks is that their pectoral girdle is actually attached securely to the back of their skull. And that makes you know, movement very difficult on land. And what we start to see in these early fishes is a, a detachment of that pectoral girdle from the skull. And that opens up this space so that you can have more movement of the neck. The other thing that's circled here over here is, uh, is also there's an extension of the bones across the chest in these animals to support the load of the body as they're lifting themselves off the ground. So really interesting changes in order to accommodate the force of gravity. So if we go back to our shopping list then, what have we got already in the fishes? We've got lungs, lots of them have lungs. So lungs are already there. We've got jaws and teeth, and this neck is actually starting to form. And then also we have supportive appendages. So digits and robust limbs with real pelvic and pectoral girdles have developed prior to animals moving onto land. So in actual fact, um, all the parts are there. It's just a matter of co-opting them to be able to use them in this new land-based environment. So if we look at back at our fossil tree and we think about all the changes that have take pla taken place, I just wanted to give you guys this as a, a summary. We're gonna add a little bit of information, but we start here with this assumption that they're breathing air because they have these swim bladders and things uh, like lungs that are present long before a terrestrial animal uh, exists. We also have changes in the bones that make up the fin of the animal. So changes in the humerus, attachments for muscles that are new because you need different and new muscles in order to make the forces for walking. Um, Tiktaalik shows all the loss of all the opercular bones on either side of the head and that helps free up movement in the neck. Origin of digits in ichthyostega and acanthostega, the hind limb and the pelvic girdle are becoming robust. And then we move into the elongation of those limbs so that you can actually get some lift to reduce that friction with the ground. Things become fully terrestrial at that point, and then all sorts of different changes happen. You get metatarsals, all the little bones in hands and feet. Uh, pentadactyly, this, this really interesting um, pattern where instead of having eight or seven digits, we're all down to five. So all modern animals have five or some reductions. They have fewer. Um, and then potentially gill breathing is lost at that point as well. So there you've got that really lovely slow transition from fish up to tetrapod. But a lot of the traits and characteristics that were needed in order for these animals to move onto land actually pre-existed the movement there, which is really cool to think about. So to go back, to the original question and say, recipes from the Devonian, when all you have is fish, how do you make a tetrapod? The answer is really quite simple, is that you start with a lot of diversity. So the, the supermarket that you'd have to shop for your ingredients is, is prime. There's a lot there to work with. 
then you need to have an environment that's hospitable. There's that where there's something that the animal can go to and, uh, and benefit from. And then you have to have some sort of pressure that's pushing either competition or predation, pushing evolution towards animals that can get the heck out of there and take advantage of these new spaces. So with that, I'm happy to take questions and uh, I hope you've learned a little bit about fishes. Awesome, well, thanks so much. That's super, very interesting um, to think about, you know, where, where we came from and, and how we got here. Um, so we do have a uh, question in the chat uh, from Christian uh, DeRusso who asked, was there some sort of environmental change going on during the Devonian, a mutation in the DNA sequence of the common ancestor of tetrapods causing morphological changes or both? Ooh, gosh, wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I think this is, whenever I talk about this stuff, I want to have a time machine and a lot of lab equipment to be able to go back and test for these things. Um, I think, I'm not an expert at the molecular side of things, but I am, I am unaware of a particular mutation or change in mutation rate that, that might you know, exist at this same time. I'm not sure anybody can figure that out actually. In terms of changes in environment, there are some interesting things that happen um, throughout vertebrate evolution actually. The shifting of the continents, and the, the changing from, you know, shallow, warm seas to mountainous, you know, continents definitely has an effect on what ecosystems exist. And so there may be really large changes happening there. I mean, in the Devonian for the, the richness and diversity of fishes, that was a period in Earth's history where um, there was a ton of warm, shallow seas. So it was a perfect environment for these tiny, weird fish-like vertebrates to, to really diversify and, and fill all of these spaces. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's just the, the existing variation in, in the vertebrate biome is what allowed this this sort of push onto land to happen. That's what I would guess. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Currently. <laughs> good, good. Um, so I actually have a question. Were these, these fish that were sort of pre-adapted, you know, to use a sort of flippant term, were they restricted to a certain environment? Like were they all in shallow water or did they find the deep water? Like I just know that the coelacanth, which is a modern low fin fish, is a deep water species. So um, in the fossil record, do we find them all over or are they more common in one environment? That's a great question too. Um, I am not a paleogeographer, so I am not totally sure. My main guess is most of these animals that we see that, that are starting to transition, that have characteristics that, that are pre-tetrapod, should we say, are probably living in environments that are uh, coastal or lacustrine, you know, in, in areas where they're interacting with um, terrestrial environments. Uh, so, I mean, I would guess that you would have to have that because you're right, coelacanth happens to be one of the sarcopterygian fishes that still exists today and it lives at 200 meters and, and doesn't do much of anything. So that's a, it's a great example of the diversity that exists and that it's only a subset of the animals that are going to be pushed up into these new environments. And it'll be those that live close to those new environments. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that also kind of like leads into some of the next question I had was what, what is the benefit of being a low fin fish over a ray fin fish today? Oh, Today, very interesting question. Um, I'm not sure. There are so many sort of alternate or, or parallel evolutionary changes in the modern or sarcopterygians, the modern lobe fin fish, 
things like lungfish, for instance, are really interesting animals because they, they don't actually do much traveling over land. Whenever things dry up, their pools are, are you know, in places where water dries up and, and the pool disappears. They bury into the mud and create a cocoon around themselves and can live like that for years until the next rains come. So, I mean, that, that's an advantage. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the lobiness of their fin. And in addition, the lungfishes now have these crazy spaghetti-like fins that are not useful for terrestrial locomotion at all. So it's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't, I think there's so much specialization that's gone on into the modern remaining sarcopterygians that it's hard to relate that back to a, a move to a terrestrial environment. I feel like that's a real cop out of a question, of an answer. <laughs> yep, well, like I said, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah. Could you tell us about your experiments with walking fish? Yes, I can. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in my lab, we are interested in exactly this, but I'm a biomechanist. So I like to think about how animals use their body parts to do interesting things in a locomotive setting. And uh, what's more interesting really than a fish that's able to use its fins to walk. And, and so it's exciting because it, it gives us insight and information about possibly about the fin to limb transition, but it's, uh, it's also just really interesting to see how existing tissues and structures can be co-opted for a new function. So in our lab, we work on Polypterus senegalis, which is the most basal of the extant ray-finned fishes. Uh, so he's an actinopterygian. And it's a fish that's quite interesting. It has a lung and it has quite low B fins that if you put it on your desk, for instance, <laughs> it will walk. It's not, the jury's still out on whether these animals actually walk in the wild. No one really reports that. There are a few sort of vague uh, comments in the literature about that, but absolutely when you put them in the lab on a terrestrial surface, they will walk. And it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting gait, very inelegant. They flop around a bit, but it's it's certainly using their fins one after the other in combination with their body to push themselves forward. And so in our lab, we're interested in how, if you, if you keep an animal on land for an extended period of time, does that change its ability to walk? How does that change its anatomy? And is there any sort of interesting direction of that change that could tell us anything about the evolution of fishes into tetrapods? And so what we're finding are, are some interesting things about uh, how muscle fiber type changes. So over time, this is sort of like you or I going to the gym. If we go to the gym and do particular exercises, we get bigger muscles, but you can also change the type of fiber you have in your muscle. And so if you lift heavy things quickly, you'll get white fibers developing. If you do endurance things, you'll get red fibers developing. And in these fish that we walk, um, or keep on land for extended periods, what we see is uh, an increase in the number of white fibers they've got, which is uh, pretty interesting because they're doing very, quite explosive um, behavior as they're stepping. And that, uh, that you know, makes sense that they'd be switching their fiber type over. And we also see changes in the bones too for the support of the animal and the fins, which are, are, are really interesting. And somewhat mirror the changes you see in that cladogram at the evolutionary changes between fishes to tetrapods. So there's this plastic response, which is the response of the individual to a new environment that allows the fish to have uh, an improved function within its lifetime. So the, the big black box question is, wow, that's interesting. If you can improve your performance at the individual level in, in one lifetime, how, how does that factor into being able to pass that material, that genetic change onto offspring? And that's a really long conversation for another day. <laughs> Super cool. Um, 
I don't see any more questions uh, in the chat here. Oh, sure, Jackson has a question. Oh, okay. Um, Earlier, Ted Lind, uh, fish, those fish uh, like Tiktaalik and things like that, the ones who were before the ones who could crawl on the land, it's not like they were seeing land and thought, oh, I'm going to crawl out, I'm going to build more robust fins so I can like, grow arms. Uh, but they had them for a reason. Why would they eventually like, get those more robust limbs before the ones who could crawl out on the land? So that's a great question. Um, and this is sort of one of those things that makes evolution and adaptive selection work so well, I think, is that those fish were living in shallow water environments. So that when you see an animal like Tiktaalik that's got that sort of crocodile-like head, I think I have a picture, there we go. It's got that crocodile-like head with the eyes on the top. This is an animal that's adapted to living in shallow water, possibly hunting things, just eyes sticking out, much like a crocodile. Um, so if he's always in shallow water, there would be an advantage to having slightly beefier fins, right? To having joints that allow you to have more contact with the ground as you move around in that shallow water. So it's, I mean, evolutionary progress is always incrementally slow. And most often it's adaptive selection is acting on, it, well, it's always acting on existing traits of that animal. And so those traits are really just co-opted into the next function that if Tiktaalik can use its fins in shallow water like this, then it can probably use its fins okay, actually out of the water. And then selection, once it gets out of the water, then you're in a new selective environment and selection will act to, to choose those animals that have even better shaped fins for that terrestrial environment. And so it's this sort of, it's very slow process of animals that can get into a new environment, even if they do it badly, they open themselves to this selective possibility and evolution does its thing, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um. Yep, so we just have one, one final question that we ask all of our speakers. Um, what is your favorite fossil? What's my favorite fossil? Oh, that's a hard one. There's so <laughs> many good fossils. Oh my gosh. That's hard to say. I think right now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to commit to this. I'm just going to say right now, my favorite fossil is the Dunkleosteus skull. Because it's just such an impressive thing. Yep. That's, that's my favorite for now. But, you know, I'm teaching a vertebrate evolution class right now. And if you ask me in like three weeks, it's, it's probably going to be something else. <laughs> <laughs> good call. Dunkleosteus is a good one. We, uh, yeah. we have one in our, our gallery here at the, uh, the Philip J. Curry Museum. Uh, oh, cool. Actually, uh, so for everyone who's watching out there, we have a Devonian display in the gallery. Um, and we're hoping, or we, we will, um, in the next month, open a Devonian fish exhibit. So um, Dr. Stanton's talk is kind of leading up to that. So if you are ever uh, in the Grand Prairie Webley area and want to come in and see some of these fossils uh, in, in the flesh, without flesh, obviously, um, <laughs> definitely come and stop by and um, come and see some of these things, things for real. As uh, Dr. Stanton was mentioning, um, some of these fossils are Canadian. Some of the most famous Devonian fish fossils are from sites um, that, that come from Canada. So that's kind of a neat um, kind of aspect of this, this research as well. All right, so um, thanks, thanks again to uh, Emily Stanton for joining us today, being our virtual speaker. Um, and our next speaker will be in March. Uh, we encourage you to keep up with the um, with the website and our social media, our um, Facebook and Hampton, our YouTube and Instagram, um, just for information about um, upcoming events as well. Great, well, thank you for having me, Em, it was really fun. <laughs>